Magazine made me one of the 100 most influential people in the world um, for some years back. <laughs> and of course, that's not really real, but it was a nice sort of pat on the back for the last time I quit my job to do something seemingly impossible. I created a $100 laptop that, that I won that award for that globally changed opportunities, education opportunities for children. So I got the itch again and I thought somebody's got to try this, so I left my very lucrative, very prestigious job in technology to start another startup and self-fund it, thinking that maybe we can get rid of this big iron thing that saved my life a couple decades back, probably saved a lot of lives in this room, but still the vast, vast majority of humanity lacks access to diagnosis, and without diagnosis, you can't do treatment, you die. And that was me in the 90s, but I got one of those eventually. And as I was sitting in my vaunted position at a super high-tech company that I'll spare you the name of, um, I thought, whoa, maybe we can use new silicon architectures and consumer electronics to leapfrog this, get it to read and write, and make it accessible to all. So how am I doing that? I decided that we could use light and sound instead of radiation, gamma rays, two-ton magnetic fields, holes in our skull with needles digging down into our neurons, light penetrates your body. If you cup your hands around a candle, you can feel the heat. That's infrared light. It penetrates us. So does sound. If a drummer stands next to you, you can feel that sound in your gut. They're cheaper and safer than radiation. And we hit a discontinuity in Moore's law the steady march of transistor density doubling. A pole vault leap happened a few years ago as we reached pixel sizes that are the size of the wavelength of light that are in every single one of your smartphones and cost a buck. We can also print little drums on silicon that can emit exactly the same wavelength and you can delay one wavelength from one drum to the next drum and create all kinds of different Physics, well, the physics has been around, but not in silicon. This is new. Except it's not that new for me because I've been doing that for decades using analog materials in combination with silicon to modulate phase to make holograms and 50 different products. Multiple of them were multi-billion dollar products. So, and I founded the companies that shipped them. And I thought, well, why don't I throw my hat in the ring and try this? We think it can change the game on therapeutics. I'm literally, the drug of choice for therapeutics is a drug that now costs 12 years and $2.6 billion to make. So an exponential change could be using consumer electronics. So Open Water, my company, we're working on using the same unit, the same visor, to cure cancer, stroke, and mental disease just with different software layers. And, you know, it's six years later, and we've gotten pretty far. We've got some stunning results in preclinical where we're five times more effective than chemotherapy. Five times using light and sound. So I'm going to tell you a little bit more about how this works. On those camera chips you have, those $1 camera chips in your smartphone, if you get rid of the lens and use a laser, you can interfere light and see the interference and it looks like waves, like waves on the ocean. And we can read those waves like a sailor can read the waves to know where the fish are or where the land is. We use math. We can also craft the shape of sound waves into our body and using an array of these drums where we s delay those, the wavelength slightly, we um, delay the phase of the wavelength, we can focus those waves near and far, right and left, up and down, to reach anywhere we wish to in the body or brain. So let's look at glioblastoma. It's a deadly form of brain cancer. You can't remove all the cells. They hide out amid neurons. Unless you remove all the neurons, then you wouldn't have a brain. But those orange cells, those glioblastoma cells, have a mechanical property that's different than normal healthy tissue. They have different cytoplasm to nucleus ratio, different cell membranes, and we can shake them apart. They're like rickety ships and not harm the healthy tissue. It's akin to an opera singer being able to break a wine glass but nothing else in the room is harmed. We use a harmonic resonant frequency, very low frequency, very low intensity. 
lower intensity than used on pregnant women and their fetuses for the last 50 years. So we do this, we, we blast a bunch of this low frequency, low intensity harmonic uh, sound into those, the, the brain and the cancer cells, they can't take it. They compress and expand until they burst releasing proteins that then vaccinate the brain against that very cancer. This could be scaled out to all aggressive cancers that have similar, op similar uh, mechanical properties. We're working on that. We're doing this, you can do this with a cheap little chip of those little drums on silicon. So we've tried it. We've built up with our partners at Terasaki hundreds of human brain organoids and gave them human glioblastoma walked through a sweep of sonification parameters, not just the frequencies, the duty cycles, the lots of different parameters, and we killed the glioblastoma cells in one minute, 97% of them, 5x better than chemo, and the healthy cells are unharmed. Now we're scaling that out with hundreds of mice. We'll have a readout on that in a couple months. Here's some more detail where you can see the green arrows on your left-hand side, that's um, how many cells we killed as opposed to chemotherapy that are written in as um, Timidar and GEM. And now we're growing up these mice and the early tests on the mice, the tumors are shrinking. We'll have a readout in a couple months and then we hope to go accelerate into humans because we have a wait list already. It is a death sentence. People sometimes only last a year with this deadly cancer. But that's not our first product. Our first product uh, has been in human trials now for over a year, and um, we expect FDA approval next year. I started the, the company really trying to make MRI 1,000x cheaper read and write, and this is, these are some of the images we've been able to create that rival MRI and are much better than ultrasound on objective measures like voxel size and depth and contrast, but we still fall a little short compared to MRI contrast, a lot cheaper. But where we really excel is we're 200 times better at measuring blood flow. So I thought, okay, maybe we should make a subset of this blood flow into our first product. Where is there a large, urgent, unmet need to measure blood flow? Well, stroke is the number two killer in the world and that's a blood flow issue. Why do so many people die of it? Why does it disable so many? Number one, cost of long-term disability. I mean, we know how to deal with clots. We know how to fix bleeds. The, is the issue is it's not apparent what this person has. It's a timed diagnosis crisis. Specifically, the large vessel occlusion stroke is the number two killer in the world. It kills or permanently severely disables the majority of people that have it because they don't get to the therapy quickly enough. If we can get that patient, the large vessel occlusion patient, from stroke onset to thrombectomy within two hours, there's a 90% chance of no neural deficit at all. What happens in a thrombectomy is a snake a uh, catheter up your carotid and pull out the clot. It's literally a plumbing problem. We can see blood flow pretty well, so maybe we can put this blood flow measurement in an ambulance and bring the large vessel occlusion directly to the hospital that can do a thrombectomy, rather than having them go through the hub and spoke model and go to multiple hospitals, which takes time, which means if they live, they won't walk again or talk again or have a job again. So. How does that work? We take a little laser light, a laser we made, but with less light output than an optical mouse, and it, that light, as I in infrared, goes through skin, your skull, your brain, and it scatters everywhere. We take that $1 camera chip and put it on the other edge of our purple module there, and that sees that arc of light, that arc of scattered light, so we can interrogate anything happening in that arc. So here we interrogate a blood vessel, and where the light hits the moving blood cells, the light ricochets, creating a different pattern on that red camera chip. We look at that different pattern, and from that, we can see blood flow. We can even see the boom, boom of your heart. The image that we see on the camera is in the blue square, and what we extract from that using math are these patterns here of blood flow and blood volume. 
we put those modules across your head and we get red, right, left differences, the raw data of a real large vessel occlusion is there, but what the EMT or paramedic sees is what could be on this smartphone with a room assigned, a doctor assigned, at a hospital, directions there, and the team doing the catheter placement for the thrombectomy is already mobilized to set up for this patient. So we've been doing this now in large vessel occlusion units in hospitals, measuring them with our gear for about a year. We're scaling up those trials. We're in two high volume thrombectomy sites, one at Brown University, one at University of Pennsylvania. The sensitivity, the specificity look unheard of. Um, we're scaling up those trials. We're finding, we think, new biomarkers as we get more data because nobody's ever measured blood flow like this before. Um, so we expect, um, as we get those through those trials, to have an FDA approval next year. And there's one other project I want to talk to you about. Changing that harmonic frequency that we use to burst apart the glioblastoma cells, we can also read and write neurons anywhere in the brain. And that's important for something like mental disease. Sure, a lot of things cause mental disease, your parents, your relationships, your jobs, whatever. The result is neurons are either, either over-firing or not firing enough, and we can see it on MRI. Like if you look at the before treatment picture of an MR of one of our patients, that's the default mode network, and we can see ruminative negative thought in the over-firing of part of the anterior default met network default mode network that's at the top of that image on the top. And so what we do is we focus sound to that precise location, again, super low intensity, tuned to change the calcium channels and suppress the firing of those neurons. So we do that, we see an objective result of the quelling of those neurons on the MRI, but the patient after the treatment feels high and elated and scores lower on depression scores. We're about to start a whole, like next week, a whole group of treatment resistant, clinically depressed patients. We're doing this with the University of Arizona. That can also scale out to uh, substance abuse, different forms of mental disease, and at different frequencies, we can draw, grow neurons and synapses, which are, should be important in neurological disease. Whoa, sorry. There we go. So this leads, we can scan the brain anywhere we want and write maybe a mood or an image or a thought. So question, you know, Elon Musk, literally, this is a picture from Neuralink. They want to drill a one-inch hole in your skull and, and sort of plumb down these wires through your brain that, you know, kill neurons on the way down. Do you want that or the non-invasive solution? I've had non-elective brain surgery. Um, I don't see a billion people going for the... The, sorry, I've had for elective brain surgery, I've had the non-elective to solve my brain tumor problem in the 90s. I'm fine, um, but um, I nearly died. Uh, I think you'll do it if it's death versus, but I don't see everybody doing it. So anyway, we might be revolutionizing neuro therapeutics and diagnostics and scaling that out to the body for aggressive cancers like pancreatic and so forth. But it was really taking a leap of faith, a large loss of prestige, a big loss of money to start another company and try. And there's been many hard days, but I wanted to encourage you all to do it because we get to live now. You're here because you want to change things and I just want to urge you to, to, to take the leap. It can have really profound impact. I'm happy um, really to talk to anybody about this, particularly interested in anybody interested in supporting this or collaborating. And thank you very much for having me here. Thank you. Oh, wait. Amazing work. You're truly uh, an exponentialist. And as you described, you're taking consumer type technologies and bringing it to diagnostics. Um, uh, 10 plus years ago, I helped come up with a medical tricorder X Prize where we'd have like a handheld. This is sort of tricorder in reality. Yeah. Will these kinds of devices screening for stroke and beyond be in our homes? Yeah, we think so. I mean, first in ambulances, that why not? Most strokes are repeat, and then cancer treatment, why not that at home? And uh, mental disease treatment, as well as neurodegenerative treatment. So the therapeutics are 
maybe even more exciting than the diagnostics. But the same unit, different software layer does both, so. And could these not be, in terms of democratizing diagnostics, be in any clinic in rural Africa to screen yeah. for gliomas and AVMs and, and, you know, treat. and treat? We're killing glioblastoma 5x better than best in class chemotherapy. And we're treating depression where we can see the result. We quell those neurons from firing, literally. And so that could, I mean, we have to walk through the FDA and do the right things, but you know, so first as a medical product, but then as a consumer product, why not? Because basically it's being made in the trillion dollar manufacturing infrastructure that makes your smartphones. So yes, awesome. it can be made at that cost structure and volume. You're an inspiration. Thanks so much. Thank you.